Hi everyone, welcome to Calculus 2 officially. Um, so we're going to jump right into our lessons, to our content that we want to learn this semester, this over the summer course. And we're starting with chapter 8. So if you took Calculus 1 at Cal Poly, you stopped um, at probably the very beginning of chapter 6. If you took it somewhere else, um, you probably stopped with integration, like you had just learned some stuff about integration or antiderivatives. Now, yes, we're jumping to chapter 8. We will go back into chapter 6 um, next week, but we are going to start with chapter 8. So, techniques of integration using basic integration formulas. I'm going to show you a handful of formulas, actually more than a handful, quite a bit of formulas um, at the end of this video. When you learn integration or how to find antiderivatives, you have a, a lot of rules or um, like a, formulas for antiderivatives, but you wouldn't necessarily want to memorize all of them. What's better is to know how to find those antiderivatives. And so that's what we'll go through with some of these examples in this section in 8.1. So we're going to start with one of the very um, useful techniques you learned in Calculus 1, and I'll walk you through it in case you forgot how to do this. It's called U substitution. So we're going to find, here's our first example, we're going to find the antiderivative of um, well, first let me put some limits on here. Okay, This is a definite integral because I have limits of integration. So I'm going to get a number answer at the end. If these numbers weren't here, it would be an indefinite integral, and my answer would have a general antiderivative, and then I would put plus c okay, for a constant. But this is a definite integral, and we're going to integrate this function, 2x minus 3 over the square root of x squared, minus 3x plus 1 dx. Okay, And the dx, this is our differential. This is basically letting us know um, what we're integrating with respect to. So x is our variable. Like I mentioned, we're going to go through uh, this example using u substitution. So this is a very useful method for integration and finding antiderivatives. When you can see the derivative of part of your integrand, so remember, this part of your antiderivative or your integral is called the integrand, this inside part. And this integrand is the derivative of some function. So that's what antiderivatives are all about, integration is all about. This integrand is the derivative of some function, and we're trying to figure out well, what was that function that has this as a derivative. So this method of u substitution, maybe you, if you remember this, you might already see what I should pick. But basically, when you pick your uh, quantity for you, you want to think of really two things. I need to make this integration easier. This integrand should be easier to work with. That's one thing we need to think about. So my choice of u needs to make this easier to work with. But secondly, the derivative of my choice of u should be present already in my integrand. Okay, so we have a couple of options. We can pick the numerator, 2x minus 3. We can pick the whole denominator, including the square root, or maybe the third option is just the radicand inside the radical. And if you can see it, or if you remember how this goes, we should pick the radicand. So x squared minus 3x plus 1. Here's why that was our best choice. The derivative of that choice is also here. So if you see it, derivative of u, technically with respect to x, is 2x minus 3. Okay. This notation here, this is the derivative of u with respect to x, but you can skip this step and you can times by the dx and just bring the dx over here initially. You don't have to show that part if you don't want to. And would you look at that? That's already right there. So this is a really nice example where the derivative of our choice for u is very clearly right here. So this is square root of u. Okay. And now everything on top, to include this dx in the back, is du. So all of this gets substituted. Okay. Now, if it's not clear to you that all of this becomes the du, so I'm just going to put the du right here, but normally I will move it to the back. If that's not clear, you can divide and substitute just for dx. So we already have what we're going to work with. But if this didn't make sense, let me show you. You would just divide over here. You can divide both sides by the 2x minus 3, 2x minus 3, and then you could substitute 1 over 2x minus 3 times du, that's the left side of my equal sign here, equals dx. 
and exactly where there's a dx, you can replace that. Okay. And so what would happen is this 2x minus 3 would divide or cancel with this 2x minus 3, and you'd be left with this du anyway. Okay. So if that's a little bit more clear to you, you can do that. Now, normally, I'm just doing this to show you, but normally I'll just scoot that du into to the back here. So let me make that a little bit more clear. This is what I would usually do. Okay. But feel free to leave the du on top, at least initially, but then you want to just be in the habit of moving it back. Okay. This is letting us know we're integrating with respect to u. Okay. Now, why I put the x equals 3, x equals 5, is to remind myself, when I'm ready to plug in my values, that this is not my numbers, because I'm working with u. Okay. So we'll address that when we get there. So now, we are ready to use one of your integration rules or techniques and we're going to use the power rule. So you're going to use this rule quite a bit. So we're going to use the power rule here. I'm going to um, erase a little bit just to give us some room. Okay. Sorry, there's vacuuming going on out there. I don't know if it's getting caught in the video. But hopefully you can still hear me. All right. Now, if you're working on paper, you should kind of leave that stuff on your paper. I just got rid of it to save some space. But you want to know what you chose for you. Okay. So I'm going to rewrite my integrand. And let me remind you from algebra, this is the same as one half power for you. Okay, so real quick from algebra, if you have a radical, okay, there's a pow invisible power here, I'm going to call it n. There's an invisible um, index, this is an index when it's like in this little crevice here, and you can always rewrite any radical as a rational exponent. The number that's the power is the numerator and the index is the denominator. And so for a square root, there's an invisible one here, and because it's a square root, there's an invisible two. So just a quick reminder about that. Now I'm gonna go one step further, and I'm gonna bring this up using a negative exponent. So again, this is when x was three to x is five, and then erase this. This is the same thing as u to the negative one half power using our rules of exponents. So if you have uh, a variable on bottom or any single factor on bottom of a uh, fraction, you can bring it up if you just have a negative exponent. All right, now we are ready to integrate. So here's, all of this was to get us ready to integrate. Now we're gonna use our power rule and our power rule says we take the original power and we add one to it and then we divide by that new power. So I'll just write it out, negative one half plus one is what we divide by. And then we evaluate at our values for our limits of integration, but I have to address those. So negative one half plus one is positive one half. So same thing on bottom, positive one half. Now here's where you have an option. You could change your limits of integration to be in terms of u, or you can substitute back for x up to you. Perfectly fine no matter what you choose. So I'll actually show you both just to remind you that you can do either one. So let's make this look a little bit better real quick. This is when I flip and multiply this is 2 u to the 1 half which is also 2 square root u. Okay and again I have my limits in terms of x so I need to address that. So this is where I'll separate it into two options. Don't do both. Pick one that you like. Okay. All right, so option one. Option one, doesn't matter which one you pick. Option two. Okay, so option one, I'm gonna go back with x. So what is x equal in terms of my limits? The lower limit was three, the upper limit was five, okay? And if you remember, we had substituted what u was. So I'll write that in blue. We said u should be um, the radicand. It was x squared minus three x plus one. Okay, we're gonna use this fact for either option. Let's move this out of the way a little bit. This is what we're focused on. Okay, so where I have a u, my antiderivative is two square root u. I'm gonna substitute what it used to be in terms of x. So this is two square root x squared minus three x plus one. And then I can evaluate from three to five, okay? And then remember how this goes. You start with the upper limit and then you subtract when you plug in the lower limit. So this is two square root of five squared 
minus 3 times 5 plus 1. I'm going to just make this clear. That's the first term. Minus 2 times square root 3 squared minus 3 times 3 plus 1. Okay, and whatever this equals is my answer. Um, I'll wait on the answer until I show you this option. So option 2 is to change x into u for your limits. Okay, so remember our antiderivative was 2 square root x. We have it here though. Okay, so my upper limit was uh, 5. So I need to find the upper limit for u. So basically I just say, well, what is u when x is 5? So I just plug in that upper limit and then I get what u should be. So let's see, this is 25 minus 15, that's 10 plus 1, that's 11. So my new, I'm going to put upper limit, ul, is 11. My lower limit, when x was 3, same thing, what is u when x is 3? So 3 squared minus 3 times 3 plus 1, that's 9 minus 9 plus 1 is 1. That's my lower limit. Okay. So then my antiderivative, 2 square root u, is evaluated from u is 1 until u is 11. Okay. And then same process, plug in. So we get 2 square root 11 minus 2 square root 1. Simplify that a little bit. Not very much you can do here. 2 square root 11, square root of 1 is 1, so minus 2. Final answer, and in the calculator, I think, let's plug that in real quick. 2 square root 11 minus, ah, yeah, 2 times 1, that was right, minus 2, I am getting 4.63, roughly, so about 4.63, okay, so the same thing would have happened back here, let's just double check really quick, so we already actually figured this out, but let's verify 25 minus 15 is 10, plus 1, that's 11, 2 square root of 11, minus 9 minus 9 plus 1, 2 square root 1, same answer. Okay, so either way you choose is fine. All right, so I'm going to show you some uh, formulas, a whole bunch actually, in a table, and then we'll do another example in, in our next video. So here is the table I was mentioning with lots of integration formulas. Now, notice there's 22 of them here. Um, again, like I mentioned at the beginning of the last video, you don't have to memorize these, and I don't really um, want you guys to memorize everything, but you do want to know how to figure them out. So some stuff, you know, unfortunately, you do have to memorize, not all of it. So for example, if you remember your derivatives, that's going to help a lot. So if you look at, like let's say um, over here, 6 through 11 with these uh, integration formulas, if you remember your derivatives for your trig functions, you can easily um, work backwards with the antiderivative. So if you remember that the derivative of cosine is negative sine, if you go backwards from sine, your antiderivative is cosine, but you've got to put that negative on um, because it's not part of the integrand. So those ones, if you remember your derivatives, you're good to go. Same thing for e to the x and a to the x, the antiderivatives of those. If you remember the derivatives, then you could remember the antiderivatives. Um, derivative of ln is 1 over the argument, 1 over x. So the antiderivative of 1 over x dx is ln x. And then all these are plus c because there's no um, limits of integration on them. The rule you will use the most, well, very often, is your power rule. So your power rule works oftentimes. We used it in our example in this video um, where you add 1 to the exponent and divide by that new power. And remember your antiderivative of a constant. Technically, there's like an x to the 0 over here as your integrand. So when you add 1 to that exponent, it becomes x to the 1. So antiderivative of a constant is just your constant times x. Now the other side of this table, a little bit trickier, and some of them, you, these are the ones I'm saying you probably do want to commit to memory, um, at least for some of them, like 12 through um, 15 here. It would be a little faster to know these than to try to figure them out every time. But again, you can kind of just figure them out. You would say, okay, well, whose derivative is tangent? Which function has a derivative of tangent? And you would think about your trig functions. 
And you can see it if I work backwards from the answer here. The derivative of um, ln secant x is 1 over the argument. Ah, sorry, I'm trying to use the mouse to draw. I, I'll use my stylus next time. Um, so 1 over secant x times chain rule, the derivative of the inside being secant. And so if you remember, see if you can beat me to the answer here, the derivative of secant x is secant x tangent x. And so the secants would divide out here, and that's how you would get tangent. So if you're working backwards, the antiderivative of tangent, you would get uh, ln secant x. And then just remember when you're working with ln, um, the argument of a natural log or any log function, the argument can't be negative. That's why we use those bars. So that's the reason for the absolute value bars. Now, let me make a mention about a couple of these. So these two here are hyperbolic functions, um, as well as down here, inverse hyperbolic functions. We are not going to talk a whole lot about hyperbolic functions. It's actually covered in um, section 7.3 of your book. You can look at that if you'd like. Uh, we, I'll mention it in the future a little bit in another video for another section. But we're not going to do a whole lot with hyperbolic functions. That's what that little h is for, so letting you know about the hyperbolic functions. Um, I'll mention it, though, in 8.4, 8 uh, just a little. Now, these last ones, 18, 19, 20, these are your inverse trig functions, um, antiderivatives of them. So if you remember when you learned about derivatives of inverse trig functions, we're just going backwards now. Um, I will show you in the, another video how to um, find the antiderivative of one of these. And I'm going to use this table to show you how to find that. But in the future, in the very near future, we're going to actually figure out how to do this, how to solve for these. And so I don't like the idea of having you memorize these three from this table, especially because I'm going to show you how to figure these out in 8.4. Um, so just be aware. I am going to show you with the table for this section, 8.1. But in 8.4, we'll learn how to figure these ones out.